Lord today. We're going to speak on Matthew 13, verses 53 through 58. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you. Let your word speak to us like it did to me. I ask you to just minister to every single heart, to our minds, minister to our purpose in you, that we truly understand who we are and whose we are that we continue to hear you above any other voice in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Uh, let me know when you have it. You can say amen. I can, uh, Matthew 13, 53 through 58. Thank you. All right. I'm going to read it. it. said, when Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there, coming to his hometown he began teaching the people in their synagogue, and they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and this miracu these miraculous powers? They asked. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And on his brother's names, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Aren't all his sisters with us? When, did, when then did he, this man get all these things? And they took offense at him because Jesus, but Jesus responded and Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Amen. Amen. And I know we've read this and seen this and a lot of people preach about it, but I really been feeling that the enemy has really been attacking who we are by using our past. And it's not just for me, because I know this is very applicable to my life, but I just feel like the enemy has really been coming against all of our, our identity and future in Christ by using our past, everything we did, everything, you know, what was, what was spoken about. And so I just wanted to really bring a word, you know, that the Lord gave me, you know, that we, just like Jesus, you know, I always say he was the carpenter and he was the savior. And so it's okay to have a past, you know, and it's okay to have a future in Christ. You know, it's okay. It's okay that we did the things that we did. They may not have been perfect, but it helped us become the people that we are in Christ now. So I just wanted to start off with that. You know, prior to going to his home, um, he spoke um, all types of parables. And parables are simple stories. Um, they're simple stories to other people, you know, and they're very revealing to us as believers because in every parable you will find those hidden treasures that the Lord wants to reveal. And in the word, when I spoke to the prophetic class at one point, I told um, one of the prophetic classes that, yes, it is like hidden to, to regular people, but to us, God will reveal like really keys and strategies through those parables. And those parables are simple stories to others, but very revealing to us. And we find a lot of keys to minister and every time we look at it, like we get something new. I don't know if you're, it, it's like that for you, but every time, every time I get, excuse me, I'm going to be drinking something warm because my throat was hurting a bit. So um, every time I read different parables, I get something different each time. I don't know if that happens to you, but it really happens to me. But the word is a living word. Mm -hmm. So it should be applicable to different situations that are happening at this moment. So just wanted to share that. So um, he finished the parables, and that's what I like about um, this story. There's a lot of different things, but what is showing us that he had a specific assignment about the parables, and he completed it. And we have to really understand that we have to complete our assignments wherever we go. So if the Lord sends you somewhere to do something, finish it, you know, get it done. And then when you have to go home, you go home, you know. And so when he finished it, he was doing his business everywhere. He was doing the father's business. He was performing miracle signs and wonders everywhere he went. And then the Lord brought him home. You know, it's like he went home. And what happens when we come home? You know, and this is what we're seeing in this story. What happens when we go home? When he gets home, he starts teaching in the synagogue. Because in, in Jesus' fashion, he didn't just go home and go chill with his family first. He went to do something specific and and like him he's like okay i'm not going to go home first i'm going to go to the synagogue and wreck these people's lives <laughs> it's like i really think about that you know like it, jesus knew 
that, you know, a prophet is, you know, not without honor in his own, you know, home. So he knows this. So it's like, what was the purpose of him going to the synagogue to teach? You know, you think about these things. He knew what he was doing. Everything with him is so strategic that it's amazing. But he goes to the synagogue when he gets home and he's teaching in the synagogue. And, you know, we think about where is home? Where is home for you? Um, I don't know if you guys can say um, where you're from. I want us to really be interactive as well. You know, I like that. Um, for me, home is uh, Pembroke Village in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And Pembroke is a project. And many people look at my home as the ghetto, you know, uh, Bethlehem. So when you say you're from Pembroke, people look at you like, oh, ghetto. you're from the ghetto. The ghetto. <laughs> and Pastor Angel saying, it is the ghetto. That's true. But you came from there. Right? But I came from the ghetto, and that's okay. Yeah. You know, and, and I can say that. Um, where are you guys from? If you want to speak out, anybody who would like to speak. Well, I was raised more in Puerto Rico. Where's your home, your original place that you were living? Go ahead, Pastor Jackie. Well, my home is from Brooklyn. So. Brooklyn. <laughs> New York. <laughs> yup. Queens, but Brooklyn. And then I was raised in Puerto Rico, so. All right, all right. But your home is New York. Um, yeah, yeah. She's from Bronx, New York. Modern fighters up in the house. <laughs> My home is the Lower East Side, Manhattan. Mm. New Yorkers. I'm trying to realize hot, why. Very hot. Fighters. <laughs> I'm from the ghetto. My mom says she's from the ghetto and she love it. What? <laughs> love it. Back to... home. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I lived there until I was 16. Um, and then I've been in lived in New York for 21 years. So I think my home is New York, even though I was born in Cincinnati. All right. Yes, All right. ma'am. I'm starting to realize a trend up in the ministry. California. Come on. Talk to My us. husband is from Soho, also well as Manhattan. Right. Little Italy. But he was born in the Dominican Republic. All right. All right. So, and then um, one of you has stayed in California. And then the girls here. Born in Allentown. Raised, kind of raised in Bethlehem. And then raised in Puerto Rico and then back to Allentown. All right. So... <laughs> She's from Allentown. She just said too much. She, she just pulled a day now on us. She gave a whole dissertation. I'm just saying, I see you. <laughs> My kids were born and raised in Bethlehem, but they've been in Allentown for like the last. Yeah, okay. Bebe says Allentown. So, so yes. Um, and I'm from Easton, and, Pennsylvania. Okay, Heather is from Easton, Pennsylvania. Pastor Angel? Oh, sorry, I'm from Puerto Rico. Mom. Nobody here nice. knows where that's from. We're all like, whatever. <laughs> I do. Listen, Sandra, where are you from? Sandra, where are you from? If you're going to jump in and say something, say something. I'm from Ponce, Puerto Rico. <laughs> all right. Oh, and brother, brother Ricky is from San Sebastian of Puerto Rico. Right, a lot of Puerto Ricans and New Yorkers in the house. And the Pennsylvanians were, and Californians were the awkward ones up in here. I'm feeling kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> so, so with with Jesus, his home was Nazareth, and you know, and it was a small town. You know, just I don't know if your phones are muted, but just make sure you're. Let me mute you. I just want to make sure everybody's muted. So with Jesus, he came from a small town with Nazareth and it, the, it was surrounded by hills and it wasn't very accessible. So, I, you know, like when you think about it, it wasn't a town that was like hustling and bustling with business and stuff like that. So just things to think about, you know, when you think about your home, you know, I think about the areas I was at, I had to walk to everything. I had to walk to school. I had to walk everywhere that I went, wanted to go to. But the area that I was at, you know, we had a penny candy store. Um, we had, you know, a lot of, like, a lot of drugs, a lot of violence, you know, and, and Pastor Angel does confirm that, you know, where I was living is the ghetto, so whatever. But something good came out of it, right? So, and Jesus came out of that city, and something amazing came out of Nazareth for all of us. So I just want to, you know, when you think about home, 
it may be a bad place for many, but many good things come out of those different places, right? So they were, he went home and he goes in into the synagogue and he's teaching. And the synagogues were known as a place for trials, for teaching, caring of the poor, and like just accommodations for, for Jewish people from everywhere. So if somebody was traveling in that was Jewish and they were traveling in from like another city, they would actually stay at the synagogue and they would actually set up accommodations for them within the city. So almost like a, a welcome center as well. So the synagogue was like a really important place. So Jesus made sure to go to his hometown and go to one of the most crucial, important places and go in and just start teaching. So it's like he was making them aware, like I'm home and this is who I am. And, you know, you may not recognize me, but this is who I am. And so they start talking about him and like they, they start asking questions. And when people start asking questions about you, generally from your past, they start questioning what? your identity, who you are, whose you are, why you're doing what you're doing. And it sometimes can bring an insecurity to you because of your past, you know, like, am I deserving of this? Should I do this? And so the first thing they do is, the first question is, where did this man get all this wisdom and miraculous powers? Like, really? Like, they start questioning, where did he get it? You know, like, who's the source? of these miracle powers, who's the source, you know? And, and I think about this thing and they say, this man, they didn't even recognize him as Jesus. They didn't even recognize him as Emmanuel. They didn't even recognize him as, you know, the savior, the Messiah. And it was like this man, where did this particular man get these powers from? So they couldn't figure it out. So because they couldn't figure it out, they wanted to start judging it and start questioning it. And then the next question they ask is, isn't he the carpenter's son? And it, it really, like I was bothered because it's not like they even gave Joseph his name. They knew Joseph by his trade. So he wasn't, you know, even important enough to like, hey, I'm going to say your name. You know, I'm going to say, hey, isn't he Joseph's son? You know, to give him some respect. No, we're going to we're going to talk about him by what he does, by what his father does. And we're not even going to say Jesus. We're going to say the carpenter's son. And so Joseph, you know, his name never even came out of their mouth. And to me, it's like, it's like when people say, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, are you Bebe's mom? I'm like, I got my own name. I'm my own person, you know, like, or, or like they remember you. Aren't you Lisa's kid? You know, and, and, you know, but they actually know your parents, you know, they say something about one of your parents. But in this case, I was really troubled that, you know, they didn't and they minimized him and they minimized his family just by what they did by trade, you know, and, and it's kind of like pretty sad that they minimized him. Yet most of them probably had a lot of the work, the woodwork and a lot of the carpentry stuff in their homes that Joseph and Jesus made but they didn't even recognize his name because at that time when you were a carpenter, you fixed doors, you did a lot of a lot of woodworking, but you did a lot of things that were practical for people's homes and for people's livings and for like like the buggies or not even buggies, but different things, chariots and different things that had to be things. So Jesus and Joseph had been doing this work. Jesus did it for 33 years before he got into ministry. He basically was under his father. So to minimize him after only three years in ministry, you know, to the carpenter's son was pretty just to minimize him. And I just kind of want us to understand that people do that. I know I really want us to, I know it sounds like a lot of information, but I really want us to understand that people will try to minimize you to what you do and not who you are. And so, and that happens to all of us. I don't know if it's happened to you, but it's like, I mean, many people still call me the banker. Like, after 20 years and, and, and the last seven years fully being, you know, in ministry to 10 years in ministry and people are like, oh, you're the banker. No, I haven't been in banking for over like at least a good seven years. Like get over it. I walk into Wells Fargo on South 4th street and people are like, are you coming back? No, I'm never coming back. Like, why are you still talking about it? <laughs> because my, my identity was almost associated with what I was doing. You know, and that's what we want to make sure that that when we're working for the Lord, we're not known by what we do, but who we are in Christ and whose we are. 
And so that was just something that I just wanted to, to understand. And it's like, it's pretty sad because Jesus name Emmanuel meant God with us. And you know, if they were already questioning his miraculous powers, they definitely didn't want to say, is this Emmanuel? Is this God with us? You know, they didn't want to admit that, you know, is this the prophet? Is this the son of a prophet? You know, is this, is this the son of God? Ain't nobody want to say that. They wanted to challenge his identity. And that's many times what happens with us, where people want to challenge who you are in Christ because of their own insecurities and because of they're not doing what they're supposed to do in Christ. So then they go into, you know, and this, this had me troubled because like they really, hold on, where are my notes? I'm so sorry. They actually started, then they said, you know, is this Mary's son? Isn't this the mother, um, isn't, what is it? Isn't, his, oh, isn't his mother Mary? And I'm like, you didn't remember Joseph, but you remember Mary. And if we talk about Mary, what transpired with Mary? You know, she got pregnant out of wedlock. If we just start thinking about all the things that, you know, what happened. And then um, Joseph had to accept Jesus as his son and adopt him and then raise him and name him. But they remember Mary. They remember the one that, according to them, had a bad reputation, but they couldn't remember Joseph, his name. But they remembered Mary. And sometimes we people will tend to remember the bad before they remember the good about you. They remember that your mom was out there, your dad was out there, your family was living in the ghetto, your family was, you know, like dealing drugs and doing this and doing that. And you're known by your reputation, but you're not known by your identity in Christ. And so it was like they were trying to like deliberately come against his identity and minimize who he was and who he is as the savior by now. Oh, isn't he Mary's son? We know why you remember Mary. Because Mary was the one that was pregnant without being with somebody, <laughs> you know? We know why you remember her, because you're judging him based on his story, based on his past, based on how he was conceived. And since you can't believe that a miracle transpired, you want to continue to judge his character. So, you know, it, in to man, he was considered a bastard, you know? So, of course, they remembered Mary, you know, being his mom. And so it really bothered me because like in, in the definition of it, it says no bastard is no longer in its pure or original form. So if they could remember the reputation and they could remember the name of Mary, but they couldn't remember Joseph's name. They couldn't remember that he was a good man, that, you know, he had a good father. They couldn't remember those things. So as we continue to read about um, many people in the Bible that had bad reputations, you know, it was something that I recently posted, but I wanted to share it again, just so you understand, you know, the different people in the Bible that have done many amazing things, but were judged and, and did a lot of wrong as well. You know, when we look at it, Jacob, you know, I'm just going to read it down the list because I posted it recently. Jacob was a cheater, right? Peter had a temper. I, I'm, I'm a Peter sometimes. Okay, many times. Um, <laughs> David had an affair. Noah got drunk. Jonah ran from God. Paul was a murderer. Gideon was insecure. Miriam was a gossip. Martha was Martha was a, a warrior, a, a warrior in the sense of she was worried. Um, what is it? Thomas was a doubter. Sarah was impatient. Elijah was moody. <laughs> That's what he says that. Moses stuttered. Zacchaeus was short. And I guess short was, I mean, he was an extreme amount of short if he had to be on a tree to try to get Jesus' attention. So we're not making fun of short people or body shaming him. Just be aware. Abraham was old and Lazarus was, was dead, you know? So we start thinking about the things that transpired where people went through different things and had different disabilities and had different complications or, or murdered people. Like when you think about Paul, Paul was a murderer. And we speak so highly of Paul, like we don't realize that he murdered like a lot of Christians. And he, like, he was a serial killer. He was a mass murderer. He was a person that really went about. And he said, when I was in that old sect, when I was in that religious ways where I thought I was doing right, I was doing so much wrong. So sometimes, and then when his name was changed from Saul to Paul, people were still scared of him. They were like, was that the guy formerly known as Saul? Because he's the one who, I'm not going to that service. I ain't getting murdered today. You ain't setting me up to get killed, you know? So his reputation 
we talk about him so highly today, but there was fear that was brought about when say when you would say, Paul's coming to the service today. Hell no, I ain't showing up. That guy's going to kill me. I'm not coming to service today. You're going to psych me out. And all of a sudden he's Saul, not Paul. Why? Because we got stuck on his past and not understanding that God could restore that, that God could change that, that God could take a man who stutters and have someone else be the mouthpiece so that he could speak to him and then somebody else. God will get his message out of who you are and whose you are, whether we agree with it or not, you know? And so it was just amazing to see these things where people have looked at people in the word or even at our lives. I don't know if you have this issue, but when people look at me from my past, they're still judging me based on my past. And I'm like, you know, I've gone to a place of understanding that God is very small for them. God is very small if you cannot believe that he can change Liz Martinez. God is very small to them because I wasn't Paul. I wasn't murdering people. You know, I, I didn't spend time like, you know, stabbing people, killing people. And it's not to say that Paul's any better than what I did. But the thing is like, you can believe God can forgive Paul. Why can't you believe God can change an attitude or change a way of living or the things that I did in the past can't be forgiven? And so these are just things that I want us to really understand that that even Jesus dealt with this. They were really coming at his identity, you know, and, and his present tense of what God was doing in his life, you know. And so we look at names in the Bible and what they meant. You look at Isaac. His name is God brought me laughter. Like your our names mean something so amazing. I don't know if you know what your name means. If any of you know what your name means, if you want to actually say that, you can come about and say it go ahead don't all speak at the same time tell, you could tell me what your name is jackie I, t I gave you a little assignment for last sunday to look up um your name in hebrew so <laughs> my mine mine's um said um god protects protects me Amen. So it's, and it's true god has been protecting me a lot Amen, baby. My name means messenger of God. Yeah. Messenger of God. That was Bebe. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't find your name. My name means my God is an oath or my God is abundance. And I honestly know what those two things are in my life because really he has so been so abundant in my life. Yeah. Who else? Um, my name means, uh, well, Dana means God is judge. Uh, Shavon, which is my middle name means God is gracious. And then rainy just means water that falls on the ground and replenishes the earth. Yeah. Yeah. I typed in your name. I just put yeah, yeah. Hebrew meaning and it's different, um, derivatives and stuff that come in from the past, but, um, it says, which means graced by Yahweh. God is gracious in different languages. So, okay, well, I was close. I just typed in Yaya. Cut me a break. Just take the name. <laughs> She's like laughing. Well, I'm going to look that up and I'm going to spend time on your name. I like to look up names of meaning, uh, meanings of names. Anybody um, else? Can I just say something real quick for Yaya? Sometimes too, it helps if you break down like, your name like if you just say ya and then is that it your name's just yaya or is it like a whole full name like what's the full name anil y-a-n-i-l-l -L. Oh, okay and then maybe break down what n-i means or n-i-l-l -L means and then you'll get you know the definition yeah and i typed in ya and if you look at ya like yahweh you know and so it just it gave us that definition that's what i looked up so yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, my name is like, um, but it says angel messenger. God, but our middle name is Lewis, and Lewis is mean uh, a famous warrior. Famous warrior. That's Amen. my middle name. Amen. Anybody else? It says the head of spring. The head of spring. Okay. 
I can't find my name anywhere. Okay, that's fine. And it's not that we have to all find it. The point is not about that. We, I'll, I'll look them up later for you guys, and I'll send them to you. I spend but time. My general meaning of my I, name is Grace. I spend time on this type of stuff because it's it's important to know what your name means. Emmanuel, you know, like they didn't want to recognize the God with us, you know, and, you know, just the different names really are important. Even in the word, many times when they named people in the word, they named them after what they did or what they would do. You know, when we look at um, who was it, Jacob, he was named, um, he his name meant he deceives. And it's really what he became, you know, like, and, it, and to me, I'm like, dang, how do you know your kid's going to be like this, you know, for the rest of his life? But um, it's just something that we really have to look at. You know, he, they didn't want to recognize his name. They didn't want to recognize who he was. They didn't want to recognize Emmanuel, God with us. They really wanted to minimize him. And so it's important to know who you are. It's important to know your name. It's important to know the meaning. It's important to know who God created you to be and what he wants you to do. And so Jesus knew because he went right into the synagogues to just wreck them in his own hometown. And then he just let them have all these questions and, and they're having questions. And I'm assuming he's sitting there like hearing them talk as he's just like, whatever. And, and I just love him. And then they're like, isn't his mother Mary? And so then they go into his brothers are James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. So then they separated mom, they separated dad, they separated the brothers. But then they go into the sisters and they don't even give the sisters the names. I was like, and so minimize even the woman, the women that are associated to him, which were his sisters. They're like, aren't all his sisters with us? So they just clumped all the sisters into one thing to just... Even now, I'm not even only going to minimize you and not give you a name, but I'm also not going to give your sisters, who were some of the people who were evangelists, who were some of the people who really changed the world when it came to the gospel from the start. And so even minimizing the family that, that he was raised with. So sometimes even the family that we're associated with and that we were raised with, even that puts a label on us, right? Like when I was in high school, I don't know about you. When I was in high school, I never said I was a Valenz, ever. Like I never said it, especially in high school, because my brothers were like always fighting. My brothers were always dealing drugs. Even in high school, my brothers were doing stupid. They were dating every girl, you know, and it was like they had competitions. So I definitely didn't want to be associated with these two goofballs that I was living with. And so like when I would be in my classes and my one teachers would be like, are you Velez, um, related to Jose and Alex? I'm like, I don't know those guys. <laughs> I really in front of God, I'd be like, I don't know those guys. And it's, it's sad to say that I denied them, but I denied them because they were so bad and their reputations were so bad that I did not want to be known by their reputation. And so like, usually I would wait until the teachers and I had a good relationship and I established myself as a good student before I would say, yeah, they're my brothers, I'm sorry. They're idiots, but they're my brothers. <laughs> it's like, it's like what I always say, like they're stupid, but they're my stupid, yeah. You know, and so it was sad because I knew that I would be judged based on their reputations and they were suspended and they had all kinds of issues. But sometimes we realize that we're being labeled because of where we come from, of who we come mm -hmm. from, who's our family, what language we speak. Many times, if I didn't speak, people just assumed I spoke Spanish and then would speak to me like I was slow. And I, I would have teachers in the high school. Um, we had a lot of racism at that time and we're still battling with that. But I would have teachers would be like, do you understand me? And, I'm, and then I'd come out with my English and I'd be like, oh, you speak English. I thought you spoke Puerto Rican. Like, I didn't even know that was a language. And so, like, you know, it's like, it's pretty sad, the ignorance of people labeling you because of where you come from. And if Jesus experienced this, so if Jesus experienced this, who are we to think that we won't experience it? If he was hated, why would we not think that we won't be hated? I mean, especially that we're being labeled by the love we have of Christ, the love of, of him saving us. And where we go, they can see that. People can see that. They can see where you're from and they can see where you're going in Christ and they want to start judging it based on your past. And so I didn't like the fact that they 
they minimized you know his family they minimized his father they minimized his mom based on her reputation they minimized his brothers they minimized his sisters to not even having a name just bunched them all together and then then they go back into where then did he get all these powers and all these things where did he get all these things so now they've already messed up talking about his family and where he comes from and who he's, his family is. Now they're going into the things he's doing, the teachings he's doing, the miracles he's performing. Where did he get all this? You know, and they wanted to know as of the timing. And there will come a point in your life that because you're past, people want to know, when did Dana get so well trained to dance and worship when did prophet wani get trained to be a prophet who told her she was a worship dancer who told her that she's a prophet who told pastor jackie she's a pastor when did they think you know like they want to know the exact date as when this transpired like like the approval of what you're doing for god comes from them like they need to put a stamp of, of approval on what god has done in the eternity over your life and, and it's pretty sad. <laughs> I saw your face, Wani. <laughs> so like, it's just sad because many people have come to a place where they think that they have to approve what God has approved. And we don't need them to approve it. You know, yes, I would love to be in partnership with people. I would love to have walk hand in hand with them. But if they don't, I'm not needing that. And you shouldn't need that. And Jesus was just letting them have all these questions. And I'm just imagining what Jesus is doing while they're having this full conversation and questioning everything about him. Like where, when, you know, where then did he get all these things? And do you imagine? He's like, I'm the creator of the world. I was there before you idiots were even, you know, a, a thought in anybody's mind, you know, like, <laughs> like I, I mean, I really think about it because Jesus is, is funny and he can be really, really silly. I say that because, and I'm, I don't care what anybody says, Jesus has to be funny because I can imagine him just sitting there as they're having all these questions. And I'm just imagining his face like, okay, enjoy yourself. Keep talking about me. And then after they talked about all these powers and all these things, and he still didn't say anything, they were offended. It says, and they took offense at him. What the heck did Jesus do that these guys were so offended? That's the real question. I'm asking you that. I would like you to answer. What did they do? What did Jesus do that they got so offended? Nothing. He spoke God's word. <laughs> you know what he did? He was just himself. He was God with us. He was the creator and the savior, all sitting there, knowing who he was, but not justifying who he was. And that is the thing. We must learn not to have to, I don't have to sit here and justify who I am to anyone. God created me to be who I am. And I'm just, I've learned through the word that it's like, you don't have to approve me. You don't even have to like me. But I know who I am and I know whose I am. And, you know, and Jesus just, it just makes me laugh because now they're offended. Now they enter into a state of offense. They question everything about him, question everything about his family, who his family was, who his sisters were, who his mom was, you know, judged everything about him. And now they're offended at him. Offended at him because he was walking in the purposes for which he was created. And probably they're having insecurities and not walking in the purposes for which they were created. So it's easy to judge people when you're not doing what you're supposed to, right? It's easy to stand on a pedestal and judge people when you're looking from above, yet yeah, they're doing the work while you're standing there looking pretty. You know, it's pretty easy to do it that way. But I just wonder how they were so offended at him healing people. How are you offended by me healing people? How are you offended by me teaching the word of God? How are you offended by me undoing the works of the enemy? How are you offended if you're a Christian by someone laying hands on the sick and healing them? How are you offended by the Holy Spirit moving through Dana, you know, in a different way than he moves in my life? How am I offended by that? Why wouldn't I come in and be like, go, Dana, you got this in Jesus. Like, get it. Come on. You got this. Cast out that demon. I'll stay here and support you because I really don't like to cast out demons. But, you know, <laughs> if I have to, I'm going to do it. But, you know, the point is that if you have this strength in an area and I have this strength in an area and we come in and we complete each other, 
we can then work together in ministry. We can work into the purposes for which we were created instead of competing, instead of fighting, instead of always coming against each other. What a concept that I would be there to support you instead of there to combat you, you know, and, and they were busy taking offense instead of saying, how can this be something that, that I can support? How can I be like, dude, this is Jesus. You remember Jesus? He was that little annoying kid, the carpenter's son. But look at him now. He's casting out devils. He's healing the sick everywhere he goes. He's doing some amazing things. And yes, and he could fix the door to my house too, because he's not only the carpenter, but he's also the savior. He can do this work in the natural, but then he can do this work in the spiritual. So it's like we get so stuck on what people's past is, instead of taking that past and saying, hey, that past can be used in the kingdom of God. Now he could go to people's houses and fix every door while being the door. Come on. He can go to every home and fix everything in everybody's home and know that he's the answer to all their problems that are going on in their home. Like we have forgotten that what God has given us in the natural can be used in the supernatural as well. So I just want to like really have us understand. And I know it was like a little rough intro because we really have to look at those questions. Like they really came at him and they really come at you. You know, they took offense. We get it. But when you're offended, when you are easily offended by someone else's life, that's doing some amazing things in the Lord, you're going to have to check your heart. You're going to have to check your mind. You're going to have to go to your past and wonder, why am I so offended that he's doing amazing things in the Lord? Why? Something's wrong with me, not wrong with him. If he's preaching and he's doing signs and wonders and he's and he's educated, and I don't know when he got his education, but I need that that resume sent to me ASAP so I can approve his, his identity in Christ. No, something is wrong with our hearts if we need to approve what God ordained in the heavens. Every single one of us, what does the word say in, in Jeremiah? Does it say, when I formed you in the womb of your mother, I appointed you and sent you out as a prophet onto the nations. And all this happened before you were even out of the womb. And he knew you. That means he spent time with you in the eternity. Who am I to judge what he knew in the eternity here in the present and natural for us? Who am I? Who am I to say who you are and whose you are and what you're supposed to do and what you have learned and trained probably in secret that nobody knows because I don't know when you got your training, but I don't care. Who cares if you got any training? Who cares if you never read another book yet the Holy Spirit uses you so powerfully that every time you walk into the room, people just drop and fly, and, and demons are flying and the sick are healed. Who cares? Who like w- What do I need that information for? Do you need that information? You guys are very quiet today. Now I'm just scared. (laughs) You're allowed to speak. (laughs) Your face is epic. (laughs) You guys kind of froze on me. But what do I need that information for? Why can't it be that I'm just happy that God is using you? Why can't you just be happy that God is using me? Why can't it be that we just work together in unity? Go ahead, Dana. Um, I don't remember what book it is, but I remember reading, I think it might be in Romans. I don't know. Don't quote me. But Paul talked about how the spirit moves freely, you know, through however he wills. Right. And I think when we're honoring the spirit, then we can respect how he uses and what he does. I think that it's an identity issue. I think it's an issue of pride. Been there, done this, done this, I can talk about it. I think it's an issue of um, wanting God to use us, but not understanding where we might be spiritually, you know, to be used. I feel like these people here, when they looked at Jesus, I'm kind of going there. They saw him from the flesh. They didn't see him from spirit. And oftentimes with Christians, we tend to look at things from the the flesh and not the spirit. We tend to look at things based on um, culture, based on what we've learned in the world. We've learned that if someone's used 
a lot, then that means they're better than everybody else. No, it just meant that perhaps the Holy Spirit just wanted to use them at that particular point. Maybe their heart was softened to be used. And as opposed to, instead of us looking at them and saying, we need to be like, well, Lord, you know, here's my heart, <laughs> you know, use me as you will. And then be inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the fact that the super just came on, on their natural and they're doing something amazing like and we're all in it because we're all his children and I feel like you know sometimes we forget that we are all we're all his children there's no hierarchy this whole thing I'm I'm like so sick of it I'm sorry I'm going off you can you can cut me off anytime I'm so sick of this hierarchical thinking that one person's better than the other because they're used more no that's not how God sees it God looks at us all the same and we have to trust in his sovereignty, trust in his, in his way of, of how he wants to use us and the time he wants us to use it and be content and know that we may not be used, but we can still learn and Holy Spirit is still operating through us in the way he wants us to. And instead of us looking at one another and comparing, we could be like, oh God, how are you using me right now? I'm inspired by Apostle Liz. She's teaching and it's, it's helping me. And then I can, and then he can speak to me and say, yeah, Dana, you know, understand that in your environment right now, like you, you understand, like if we really have a relationship with Holy Spirit, what that can do. Yes. And, and something that when you were speaking, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and that's why I was just like, I was thrown back because the Holy Spirit is not small for one person and large for another person. The Holy Spirit is the same for every single person, but he's going to use you at the capacity that you're available to be used. And so instead of being um, being judged for the capacity that he's used me, how about you just let him use you at the capacity you're a- available to? And and it doesn't it doesn't mean that you have to be wordy or you have to be less than or you it doesn't mean that you're you're better than me or I'm better than you. It just means that the Holy Spirit wants to use you and at that moment you're like I'm the donkey that's going to be available for him to use. And you know what if donkeys can speak how much more more his creation that looks like him that were created in his image so it can be a three-year-old speaking and being used by the holy spirit just like it can be a 50-year-old that may have have a master's or a doctor i don't care who's being used i care that we are being used Mm -hmm. and i care that when you're being used i don't got an issue in my heart taking offense about god using you what i worry about is that I'm more concerned about how God's using you instead of the lack that he's not using me. I should be more concerned that he's not using me and that he's using you. I'll celebrate him using you. And then I'll be like, Lord, I want to be used as well. What a concept. What a concept, you know? And, and that was something that like Jesus let them have their moment, you know? Jesus let them have their moment of judging his past and judging his family and judging where he came from and even judging his trade like Jesus truly let them did you want to speak Wani or you're just you want to say something go ahead I just wanted to chime in on that um in regards to you know I I love how you brought that out Apostle Liz just about how sometimes and Dana that was amazing even what you said just about how sometimes we really do we we get we take offense to other people flowing and operating. And I wanted to bring in another aspect of that because this was an area where I really struggled years ago in ministry. I really struggled with the the area of jealousy. And I believe in the body of Christ, that's the spirit that we deal with. And in this text, that was the spirit that Jesus was dealing with. These people were very jealous. They were like, how is it possible? Number one, we have to understand where he was. The fact that he was in the temple that was the highest esteem for them. If you were ministering in the temple, they only let older people be in there, be up ministering. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the elders, these people were, were literally elders, not just because of title, but in age. You literally had to be an older person to have that kind of position to come into the temple and teach. So for him to even do that, in their mind, they're like, dude, who are you? How did you get up here in front of these people? You only 30 some years old. If he was 30, I don't even know. He only was around 33 years. So he had to be early 30s 
when this happened. So they're like, you're in your 30s. How are you up here ministering, teaching and all of this? And you teaching better than the scribes. You doing more than the Pharisees have ever done. Who are you? We know you as the carpenter's son. And the thing became, there was jealousy in their hearts. There was envy in them. There was anger in them. They got offended because it's like, wait a minute, my parents, my family is more notable than your family. Yet and still you sitting up here teaching and you're doing all of this and all of that. And not only that, we have to understand that other people from other cities have bragged about him. So they sitting there like, we done heard people from Africa talking about Jesus came to our town and everybody in the town got delivered. And we're like, you're talking about Mary's boy? You're talking about that same kid from way back when. So we have to understand that jealousy came in and that spirit of jealousy is very real and it's very prevalent in the house of God. It's very prevalent in our own personal lives. And if we don't deal with the spirit of jealousy, it can really overtake us. And it can get us to the point where we cannot receive the miracle. And this is why they say he could not do many miracles there. Why? Because they did not have the faith to believe he is a miracle worker. Jesus himself was the miracle worker. But if you don't believe the miracle worker, it didn't say he didn't do any. He did do some. He did some for the ones that believed. But the ones that didn't believe, they couldn't receive what they needed. And how many times have we allowed jealousy to creep in to where we can't do what God is asking us to do because we're so jealous of somebody else? And I mean, I'm that person that I'll expose myself. I've said to many a times, Apostle Liz has laughed at me because I'll be like, okay, I'm jealous of this situation. I need you to pray right now against the spirit of jealousy because right now it's a problem. And I pray God will remove it. But we got to expose that thing because if you don't expose it, it will lay dormant there and you will not get what you need from God. So I'm sorry I just had to say that. But that jealousy is real. We got to deal with it. I'm laughing because you just started like saying parts of my sermon. I'm like, shut up. And I meant that nicely. <laughs> I'm like, now you and Dana don't preach the rest of the message. I'm done. <laughs> no, it, it's awesome. And I really do like an interactive message. I just really like, and that jealousy is an issue. And it says, it says, and they took, they were offended. They were offended at him. And offense came in from jealousy. And we have to understand that spirit of jealousy really, truly is rampant in ministry. When I see somebody rising up in the Lord, instead of me celebrating them and supporting them, I'm judging them. And then I'm going to go to their past to bring up their past to try to stop them and deter them from doing what God has called them to do. But like in, in all this, like I'm just imagining Jesus's response, guys, because in all this, it doesn't even say he answers their questions. <laughs> he doesn't. Like he's in the same area, the same area as them as they're asking these questions. And so, and, and then it says, and Jesus said to them, so that means he was in the same area areas them as they talk and joke and and i can imagine he's they're talking about you know they're talking about my father you want to talk about mothers like in my case you want to talk about my mother my father my brothers we're gonna have some issues i'm not gonna sit quiet i'm not jesus i'm not gonna sit there quiet but we learn <laughs> like you you know it's like a white chicks type of thing like you want to talk about mothers and that's how i feel like you want to talk about my mother we're gonna come at you we're gonna fight but the reality is that Jesus, we learn more from all his responses. He truly is the template for us. He just sat there quiet. And I can imagine like, you know, because Pastor Angel does this, he crosses his legs. And I don't know how he does it because he's 6'4". But his legs are crossed and he just sits there and like, and I can imagine Jesus just looking at them and just letting them have their moment and letting them talk and letting them try to, you know, undo the works of God that he has done in every city, in every place, everywhere he's gone, he's left the trail of miracles. Meanwhile, they're still stuck in the same town and they haven't gone anywhere. But that's just a side note. And then, so Jesus is sitting there hearing all this. And then all of a sudden, after all these questions, Jesus says to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and in his own home. That means there's gonna be times and Jesus, like that we, we see people coming at us for our past, but we don't even need to talk about that. Jesus is like, you're not going to accept me. I get you. I get it. You're not going to prove my past. Since when 
you know, and that was something the Lord ministered to me recently. He said, since when do you need man's approval for my work? And, and Jesus hit me hard on that recently because I went to, to a dinner, like thanking me for something God did. And Jesus is like, since when do you need man's approval for my work? And that is something that we really have to take heed to. You know, Jesus really teaches us. He's like, I don't need your approval. I don't care if you know about my mama. I know my mama got pregnant with without, you know, no man. I know she got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. I know. I know that's wrong. I know Joseph adopted me. I know this past. And I know I had a lot of attitude. I know that I fought with everybody and their mother. I know my parents were drug dealers. Uh, and, and I can be Lisa's drug dealing daughter, whatever. My family did the drug deal. I can be Lisa's daughter and still be an apostle. People can still be a whole bag and still be a prophet. I don't care. Like, I'm not saying and, but what I'm saying, this is the past. The present is I can still be a prophet and still have the past of being a prostitute. I can have a past of being a drug dealer and a drug addict and an alcoholic. And I can still be the person that God has called me to be. And what? You may not approve me, but God approved me. You may not approve me, but God appointed me. You may not approve me, but God ordained me. You may not approve me, but God still anointed me. And at the end of the day, my calling and my purpose is to who? My responsibility is to who? To God. And Jesus is sitting there. And that's basically what he said with the most beautiful words ever that took me forever and a day to try to understand. Because when I was new in the ministry and, and new into the word, I was like, what the heck does that mean? And I had to figure it out. But once I started hearing a bunch of preachings, basically your hometown and your home are not going to prove you. The day we all, all of us, and I mean all of us, this is something that I want you to get in your spirit. The day that you stop going home for approval on something that God said is the day you're going to be free. I know you're all just like, it, it smacked you. But the day you stop going home for mom's approval, for dad's approval, for your brother's approval, for your aunt's approval, for your uncle's approval, the day you stop going to grandma to approve what God ordained is the day you're going to feel a whole lot better. You're going to be free. And then you're going to operate in what God tells you, not what man wants you to do. Not what man thinks you should do. Not what man has said you are because of your family lineage. So just, just saying. And he tells, oh, that was, did you have something to say? Are you good? You guys good? Just the breathing, digestion. Apostle Liz, can I, can I say something? Go ahead. Um, I have just so many thoughts with this word today. Um, I was really like debating about leaving my job because I'm very worried about my past affecting my workability especially this morning when I see that one of the clients seems to be trying to get a hold of my social media I've been having a hard time being identified as oh that's the mom who lost her child from falling down a building you know what I mean so and I work with families and I work about talking with families about safety and this and that. So it's like, I'm worried about them saying, well, you're coming into my house about parenting and this and that. Meanwhile, what happened to the safety of your child? You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Your past cannot dictate your future with God. And you just block those crazy people. Block them. Nobody should have access to your social media. I've already told you this. Why? Because I don't put everybody that I minister to and everybody that I work with, like my clients, I do not let them have access to me. Well, I don't, I don't even, I, this morning it just happened. Like, I don't, it showed up like, um, people you may know. And I thought that I had my Facebook set up in a way where nobody can even find me with my name. Yeah. Um, and this is something that I don't even like meeting new people because 
you know, those are regular conversations. Like, oh, so how many kids do you have? And, you know, it's just. I understand, yeah, yeah. It's fresh and it still hurts. And, and it's not easy to come from the past that all of us come from. Everybody here has got a story, yeah, yeah. But if God wants to use that past, not that you be the mother of that's what happened. No, he wants to use that past for you to be able to minister to people. Jesus was the carpenter and he was the savior. And he is not was past tense because he's alive. But Jesus is a carpenter and he is a savior. I am the daughter of people who did a lot of horrible things. You know, I don't talk about my biological father because if they look him up, just like you're saying, um, they will see a lot of bad things. I don't talk about it to anyone. But if they were to research it, they would see a lot of things that are not good. I don't want to be associated with that past, but I'm also not ashamed of where I come from. It happened. And I use everything in my past to minister to anybody. Because if that's the story that's going to bring somebody to Christ, that testimony that you came to Christ through everything that you went through, and that brings somebody to the feet of Jesus, I'm going to use whatever it is to glorify God. And I know that's not easy right now. It's not easy. I, I'm, I really do not negate what you're saying. It is very difficult because it's fresh. And that's why, you know, your, your continued healing is, is your process. And as you continue to heal from it, you'll be able to, to use it for God's glory. So just give it time, okay? And we'll talk offline, all right? Anybody had something that they wanted to say for Yaya or anything? You guys can say it if you want. I wanted to continue with the message, but I don't also want to ignore this moment. We good? All right. So, you know, you look at Jesus and, and where we're from, you know, a lot of people, you know, you see the past, that past has, has almost, and even that there's a lot of people on here that our past still makes us feel so insecure, like, and we handling it, you know, like knowing that, you know, I'm from Pembroke, I don't say it to everybody, because everybody here would be like, oh, you from Pembroke, you know, and it's like, you're judging me based on what you think about a town. And, and, or what you think about a project or what you think about people that come out of there thinking that that you have it all down in your head. You have some paradigms, you have some structures, you have some beliefs about people who are Hispanic, people who are black, people who speak Spanish, people who are white. We have stuff in our heads that puts people in a place and then we just put them into a region of captivity because we have been captive in these areas because of things that we have experienced from different places or our past. And so it's kind of like, we have to really learn to not judge people based on where they come from and what they did or what happened in the past. Because when we do, we minimize the cross. We minimize Jesus's power. We minimize God's power. We minimize the Holy Spirit. When we say, you can't go further than this. This is where I put you, Hawandra Payne, this is the box you're in because you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this in the past. So this is who you are, according to me. And, and in reality, who the heck do I think I am to minimize what God can do in, in her life or your life? And we have to be careful that we don't become judges, that we don't think we're God to be able to, to judge someone's future in Christ based on their past. And this is what was happening to Jesus, you know? And, and something that we must learn that we're not from this earth. This is not, I'm not from Pembroke. I'm not, you're not from Ohio. You're not from California. You're not from Puerto Rico. You're not from New York. If the, world, the word tells us in John 15, 19, it says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. What does it tell us in the word? If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of this world, therefore the world hates you. That is what the verse says. So if you want to read it yourself, it's John 15, 19. The world hates you. Why do they hate you? Because you are from a different kingdom. You are of a different world. You are of a different place. And when you can understand that, 
you don't sit here. You could sit there like Jesus and just let them have a full conversation about your identity and your past and your history and your family. You can let them talk about your sins. You And he had none. You can let them talk about everything you did. You can let them talk about everything you did, everything people say. You can talk about everything that's in news media. You can talk about my criminal record. You can talk about my credit. You can talk about my family. You could talk about my husband. You could talk about my kids. At the end of the day, it doesn't change who we are in Christ. It doesn't change it. It doesn't change what God has decided for our lives. And then, you know, we need to understand that where we're from. Where are you from? It changes. Now I'm like, I'm no longer from Pembroke. I'm from heaven. You got a problem with that? Take it up with Jesus. I'm from heaven. I'm not of this world. I'm not of this world. Pembroke doesn't define me. And even though I was in Pembroke, raised in Pembroke, guess what? I still came out of there and I have education and I have an amazing family and I have good credit. Who cares if I have all these amazing things if I don't have credit, if I don't have God? If I don't do what God tells me, I can gain the whole world and lose my soul. Are you kidding me? What is it of worth to us if we have a bank accounts filled, if we have the most amazing credit, if we have several homes, if we have businesses, if we have education, I was going to say something not right. I, if we have so much education, you know, yeah, I wanted to, yeah, I got to work on that. Um, if we have so much education and we look the part, but we, we're not right with God. We're not okay with God. And if we lose our soul, what was the purpose of all this? If we're not walking in the purposes for which he created us, what's the point of all this? What are we doing? And Jesus just sat there. And I love it because, you know, like that, he was in the same room because it said Jesus said to them, right? So he had that conversation with them. And then I, I love this part because we, you know, he, and it goes, and he did not do many miracles. And this is where Wani stole my, my, my little punchline there. I'm watching you. So it goes, and he did not do many miracles because of their lack of faith. They stopped the flow of miracles. They stopped the flow of miracles. But it wasn't because Jesus couldn't do miracles. It's because they didn't want miracles. Jesus's powers, Jesus's miraculous wonder signs and everything that Jesus did didn't stop because they didn't believe it stopped for their lives. So how about because you're minimizing me and you're minimizing the power in, in each other, you stop a miracle that could save your life. You're stopping a miracle in your life because you're busy judging me because of my past. And that's what they did. They stopped miracles for their lives because they didn't believe in him because they were busy judging him and, and and that to me was like your powers the miracles powers signs and wonders in your life are not they're not based on someone else's approval you know god's powers over your life and in your life they're not based on your family approving it they're not based on your mom approving it or your dad approving it. They're based on God's approval. So when you walk into your family's house and you wonder why you can't do signs, wonders, and, and miracles with them, it's not because the power stopped the moment you walked into the room. The power didn't stop. The anointing didn't stop. The flow of God didn't stop in your life. It's their issue. They stopped it. They're not ready to receive the miracle that is walking in the room. Could you imagine if they would have received Emmanuel, God with us, the way they needed to? They all could have received miracles at that moment. They all could have been healed. They all could have been freed. There could have been so many miracles to talk about. But even in the midst of all that doubt, there were still miracles he performed. It was minimal but he could still perform miracles. So I want us to understand that even in that place of family that doesn't approve, there still can be miracles. Like God was still looking at that. There can still be miracles. There was fewer miracles, but there were still miracles. So you got to find where in your hometown are you assigned to do those few miracles? Where is it in your hometown 
that you can do those miracles? Who are those people in, in your family that you, that may be assigned to you, but the rest of them may not be because they're still judging you based on your past. And that's their issue, not yours. So they look at you and they're judging you based on you being a leader, a believer, a community leader, right? A lot of the family will be like, who said you were this? Who said you were that? And people in the family will say stuff like, and I don't know if you've heard these type of things, but you will never amount to anything. You are not smart enough. Your, your family is too poor. They're trash. They're middle class. You are living in the wrong neighborhood. Your mom and your dad, their reputations, you know, your siblings, they're always fighting. You know, people do a lot of fraud in that family. Your culture is not good. What language you speak is not good. You know, you're made to feel like you're less than just because of the language you speak or the culture you're from. A lot of people, you know, they expected that because I was Puerto Rican that I didn't even speak English. Like, I never understood that. Like, I, I didn't even speak Spanish all the time as a kid. I barely spoke Spanish. I only spoke Spanish because I wanted to date this goofball. And then I married him. So then I had to really learn Spanish. <laughs> so, so it's like, you know, you judge people based on what you think. And we have to really be careful. You know, you can be the carpenter and the savior. I can be this, this girl that was called mama since I was a little kid. And I can be the apostle. You can be, you know, a person who, who did a lot of damage in the past and is a prophet. You can be a person who, who dealt drugs and now you can be a worshiper. You, it, you can be that. You can be the preacher. You can be the disciple. You can be the elder. You can be who God says you're supposed to be. You can be. You can be both. You can have that reputation and still be both. And, and, you know, and I really do. I, I pray for all of our minds and our hearts right now. I pray for your, our memories. I pray for things that, that, that the enemy has tried to put in our minds and even people, those people who have hurt you in the past, your family members, your aunts, your uncles, you know, friends and family, people who have been around you, who have told you that you're just not going to amount to anything, that all you're good for is this, and all you're good for is that, or you look just like your father, or you look just like your mother, or you behave like this, or you do this, or you do that. And the Lord is saying, you know, I want you to arise. I want you to arise and be who I called you to be, who I say you are. You are an apostle. You're a prophet. You're an evangelist. You're a pastor. You're a teacher. You're an elder. You're a worshiper. You're an artist. You're a dancer. He's calling out everything that he purposed in your life. And today we come against anything that the enemy has said, any identity issues, anything that the enemy has put in to say, this is all you're worth doing. You are not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not skinny enough. You're not healthy enough. Everything that the enemy has said, we undo the works of the enemy in your mind, in your heart, in your emotions, in your memory that all these things that the enemy has tried to come against you and just say, you will still be this. Oh, you're a preacher now. Oh, you're a believer now. I can't believe you're a Christian. You're still talking like this. Father God, I come against everything the enemy has stated against our identities in you as to who we are and whose we are. And I ask you right now to just come into every home, come into every mind, come into every heart, come into every body right now. Holy Spirit, just rush in and bring the truth of who we are. I want your truth to arise in us, your truth to arise within us right now. Holy Spirit, we say prophet arise, apostle arise, teacher arise, evangelist arise, um, healers arise, Christ, the hope of glory arise within us, joy arise, peace arise, worshipers arise, musicians arise, Levites arise, dancers arise, artists arise, carpenters arise, arise into who God says you are, arise into who you are and whose you are and seek his approval above man's approval. When you walk into a room, know who you are. When you go back home, know who you are and know that if they did it to Jesus, they'll do it to you and you don't need their approval. You need God's approval. And so when you walk in, look for the few miracles that you can do. Don't focus in on the ones you can't. Don't focus in on what they're saying. 
thing, but focus in on the place that you're supposed to be, the people you're supposed to see, because there will be miracles even at home. There will be miracles even in your hometown, even where you're not well received. Your approval comes from the Lord. Your anointing comes from the Lord. Your, your appointing comes from, your, from the Lord. Your ordination comes from the Lord. Who you are comes from the Lord. And we undo everything, every word, every work, every physical act that's been done to your body to mark you, to label you, to say this is who you are. We undo everything the enemy has said about every single one of you. And we speak right now. Jackie walks into the purposes who, as who God created her to be. Jomadi, you are who God says you are. Wani and, and, and Morgan, you are who God says you are. Dana, you are who God says you are. Yaya, you are who God says you are. Jennifer, you are who God says you are. And Sandra, you are who God says you are. You know, Bebe, Heather, Kelsey, Angel, Cecia, you are who God says you are. We lift your identity up in Christ. We lift who you are, your ministry, your, what you have been called to do, what you have been called to study, your career and your ministry become one. Who you are and whose you are is lifted up right now. And we come against every thought that is contrary to what God says about you. We hold every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And you are captivated by what God says and what, who he says you are called to be. We say you are who he says you are. I am called to be his servant. I am called to undo the works of the enemy. Know who you are. That when you're at work, when you're at home, when you're in the street, when you're in the grocery store, that when you're at a restaurant, wherever you are, you are who God says you are. And even if people recognize you from the past that you had, so be it. You can have that past and still work for God and still work in your Abba's business and still work for daddy and still be able to do what God says. Go in, go in and lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Go in and prophesy. Go be the light of the world. Go be the salt of the earth. Go be who he says. Go be love ambassadors everywhere you go. Don't listen to opinions. Listen to God. And we just declare that everything that they have said about your father and your mother and your brothers and your sisters, just like Jesus, you'll be like, yeah, you're right. But guess what? I'm still going to perform some miracles, even in this place. So I just bless your people, God. I bless them with who you say they are. And just seal it with your Holy Spirit right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.